In this episode of the Smart Community Podcast, I have a fabulous chat with Luke Stowe, the CEO of Alchemy Solutions, which is an Australian-based company that specializes in helping organizations make shifts with emerging technologies, coming at it from a people-centric perspective. Luke tells us about his background as a technologist and why he is passionate about how technology can enable our businesses, communities, and lives. We recorded this just as the COVID-19 crisis was ramping up here in Australia and the lockdowns were beginning. So that gives you a little bit of context of our conversation. We talk about how lockdowns are highlighting the opportunities and challenges of connectivity and the impacts of COVID-19 responses on the digital divide, work-life flexibility, health prevention and treatments, as well as many aspects of our culture. Luke and I discussed the robust conversations that are needed around privacy and data during and after this crisis and the need for us to intentionally choose the new reality going forward. Luke also tells us about the projects he's working on with Alchemy Solutions and what he learned from a Hong Kong project about the power of knowledge sharing in smart communities. We finish our chat discussing the emerging trends in health, technology and privacy and the power of human connection and sharing real stories, now more than ever. As always, we hope you enjoy listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. Welcome to the smart community, smart regions, smart towns, and smart cities. It's where we live, work, and play with smart communities. The future starts today. Big data, smart mobility. The Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for. Hi, Luke. How are you going today? Hi, Zoe. How are you? I'm good, and it's so good to see you. I think we have just snuck in uh, to record this podcast before we kind of, I guess, uh, go into full COVID mode, although we probably already are in that already. I don't yeah. Know about you. Well, we're in, I'm in Victoria and I think we're at stage three, so it already feels like we're in quite a, a lockdown phase. You know, it's only the mm-hmm. basic travel that's, um, that's going on here. Yeah, no, that's, that's true here as well. I've been talking to some of my overseas friends and I think, you know, they're in the kind of more progressed stages and uh, it's been a couple of months now and we're kind of at the start. So, yeah. And interesting times. But let's jump into this. Um, I want to record this podcast and talk about smart communities. And we'll talk, you know, we'll talk about what's happening now, but also we want to talk at kind of, you know, a broader, higher level when we do come out the other side of this. or so even during this, what are some of the things that we're thinking about and, and doing in this space? So let's start with your background and what you're passionate about. Thanks, Zoe. Uh, yeah, look, my background is I actually grew up on a farm in country Victoria and I'm telling you that for context because actually from smart communities, I started life in a very basic setting of a a large wheat farm and then um, through school discovered computing and IT and went into a career in technology. So I'm a career technologist, but I've spent uh, a number of years across a number of businesses and internationally and worked in various different settings and and cultures in terms of geographic cultures. And so my background is really a technologist, but I'm very passionate about how business and people use uh, technology. Yeah, it's a real passion for me. Mm, And so what sparked your interest in this smart community space? Uh, You know, for a long time, I've been contemplating, you know, the future of, of life within precincts and also communities and what you know technology looks like uh, for making uh, life easier for people but also you know what sustainability is going to be in place through technology and how that evolves through you know the adoption of things like uh, when it was 4g 4g and now 5g and internet of things what's that look like from a a people point of view. So how do people interact with that type of technology? So yeah, I'm quite interested in smart communities from that perspective. Mm. So tell us what a smart community is to you. A smart community for me is a very connected community uh, where the community is 
leveraging off um, not only uh, efficiencies in the way that that community operates, but also the technology is an enabler for carrying out activities um, day to day, uh, um, but also, you know, what does that uh, mean for, you know, their lifestyle and their livelihoods in terms of connectivity and, and work and uh, schooling and also just the basic things of, you know, what's it mean for uh, gathering food and and also um, for connections with family and friends, like what's that look like? So, yeah, I come at it from those perspectives. Mm, and right now, you know, it's even more important than ever, those human connections through technology, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, we've sort of had this strange occurrence thrust upon us where, you know, I use the word fathom because I find it really hard to fathom the depth and breadth of the whole situation at times, and even though they, We've got so much information that's competing and it's quite confusing at times what's being uh, put across. But I, I actually think, yeah, you're right. At the basis of this is a real connectivity issue and a feeling of loss of something, but also of a, a time when we're reliant on technology and it's becoming uh, more present in our day-to-day uh, life and livelihood that um, I'm sitting in a house now, I'm talking to you, doing a podcast, I've got family members uh, doing something very similar or working in other rooms in my house. My children are now schooling, uh, using their iPads, talking to their teachers and classmates. And even last night after they finished school, they were on their um, computers talking to their friends and having that meaningful connection. So we live in a very different time to what we're used to. And yeah, technology is playing a, a really key role in that communication and connectivity. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, you know, using technology to serve us, I think is really important. I think people are really worried that, you know, technology will take over our lives and we'll never see people face to face again. I mean, at the moment that that is the case and that's not technology's fault. Technology is enabling us to be able to see people, uh, you know, that we wouldn't normally be able to see at the moment. But I do think it's important that we keep thinking about technology as an enabler and then also thinking about those impacts, positive and negative, when we do move to a more connected world or, I mean, arguably we're already in that hyper-connected world. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really good way of putting it. And, and, you know, from a technology perspective, I always think that technology is only as good as what it does for people. You know, uh, I really put people at the front of, um, at the front of technology and I think, you know, we, we are going to come out of uh, COVID in a very different set of circumstances than what we went into it. And um, I think that technology needs to be thought about in terms of how does it make our lives and livelihoods uh, better and enrich that um, for us rather than, you know, doing it to us. Because I, I think there'll be a certain amount of thought that goes back into local communities. And that's why I, I like the smart community aspect because, you know, we, we've been on this global push for quite some time. I actually think it'll come back to more community-based activity uh, and local activity within borders, within states, within within countries than probably what it was when we went into this. And therefore, it makes the thinking around uh, what type of skills and capabilities do we need as a country and as a community much more important than probably you know, um, six months ago. So I expect that local councils and communities will start to think much more about how technology is going to help with coming out of this crisis that we're in. Mm -hmm. I'm keen to hear your thoughts around how you think Australia is embracing the smart community concept. And I guess we can talk a little bit about before and then kind of now and then maybe after as well. Yeah, it's a great question. I think, you know, Really, there's obviously health is, is a major concern uh, now. And, and so even in the conversations I'm having you know, now with clients and, and uh, with just people in general is much more uh, centred around how is health being, health prevention and health treatments being supported by technology moving forward. So if I look at pre, I think smart communities was probably discussed that, you know, a level of voice and activity within uh, communities that could be supported by things that we do today. So, you know, can I get uh, a view of, um, you know, uh, is my shop um, got a sale on for food or coffee or, or retailing uh, clothes, etc. 
where now people are much more switching that to be a conversation of, well, how do I know if I'm safe if, you know, I'm walking down the street? And um, in the city of Melbourne, for example, will we have uh, thermometers attached to lampposts that measure our uh, temperatures as we walk past? And, you know, will we have some type of wearable that will be connected to us that puts a readout back to the uh, you know the health sector that can basically track us and and make sure that we are staying healthy and out of the way of other people like are these the type of use cases that we will be talking about now as just part of the normal way that we live moving forward it sounds a bit big brotherish i know but i think there is uh, definitely going to be a push for much more capability around ensuring that we stay well and healthy moving forward um, and that could be across borders you imagine what it'd be like getting off an airplane in the future getting on, on an airplane catching public transport walking around cities uh, university campus i think security and and health is going to play a really important part of what we see coming out for smart communities mm. Yeah, it's an interesting concept and it's um, something I've been uh, thinking about and attending some webinars, particularly the US, around privacy of the data that we are giving out. And, you know, if we do it during COVID, then is that an ongoing thing? What happens to that data afterwards? I think there's lots that needs to be, you know, discussed about and how are we using that to treat people and find a cure or is it is it just to know where people are or whatever? So I think there's yeah, lots of conversations that need to happen around that space and I think we need to start having those right now because, yeah, they could end up on our doorstep because someone thought it was a great idea but then thinking about the repercussions, particularly for people in vulnerable situations and, you know, what happens with that data and all these type of things and the security, the privacy. We need to have all of those conversations and not say it's a good or a bad idea but we need to be able to have those really robust conversations with the professionals that in each of those spaces. And that's what the whole smart community space is about, actually bringing a diverse range of people together. So, yeah, I, I think those it will be, it would be really interesting times, um, but we need to start having those conversations now with professionals and community members as well, and particularly the ones that will be, you know, have the most at stake if we do decide to do something along those lines or, you know, there's so many use cases obviously that we could go through. Yeah, it's fascinating, it, it, you know, and I like I like what you just said around bringing people together to discuss it because I think that's absolutely necessary, particularly when we get to the stage of being monitored in the ways that um, we were just discussing. You know, it, it just appears to me, Zoe, that we, we've just gone through this massive change management exercise. You know, whether we've liked it or not, we are now... Uh, change managed into a different way of living than what we were even sort of six to eight weeks ago. And for me, that's um, fascinating because as people, we probably would have resisted that and we probably would have said, no, well, we're not willing to move to that. But because of you know the coronavirus, we've all accepted that change and we've moved to it quite rapidly. And for me, I think you know that's quite a feat to get most of humankind to move to that new way without us going through some sort of formal change management uh, conversation and connection. So I am interested by that. I think that's worthwhile of a further narrative and discussion because you're right, there needs to be bringing together of community leaders and just thinking about, well, what just happened here? And you know, let's reflect for a moment about how we were living six day a week ago and how we're living today mm-hmm. and what's going to stay as part of the new norm and what perhaps is not going to stay as part of the new norm. I think as much conversation around that as possible will help us all sort of navigate our way through what this looks like. Mm, yeah, I agree. And I think um, that we have been thrusted into this situation and people will be coping in different ways because, you know, for me, for example, that, you know, it's kind of working like this already, but now that it's the new normal, you know, there are still things that, I guess, you know, as much as I was doing them before, they're actually different now because everyone's doing it and I need to help and support people that, you know, aren't used to this. But then thinking on the other side, you know, we, I guess, are quite fortunate that we can do our work from anywhere or home or whatever, but we need to then think about, well, the people that can't, how are we prioritising their needs as, you know, a whole of society, I guess, Um, not just individual, but 
are we prioritizing and I talk about this uh, I used to talk about this pre about you know, prioritizing those needs on the network the transport network because that's my background but now we need to prioritize their needs in whole of life because we need fast internet connection but they need to be able to get to a place and, and you know that's how they um, earn their keep or whatever and so yeah there's there's lots of I guess nuances and and the community aspect of it as well. And someone was, um, I um, was talking to someone on LinkedIn recently about there used to be this kind of conversation between the physical community and the digital community and those things were seen as quite separate. You know, you had yeah. your online presence and then you had your physical presence. But actually the one thing, right, the, and yeah. what I call the smart life is in real yes. life. And what COVID has done is really thrusted us all into there. If we were digitally enabled before, we can be enhanced by this experience but actually, if we weren't, then we're even further behind than we were before. So I think there's lots around and this uh, the smart community conversation has to be not just about us that are thriving or not thriving necessarily, but us yeah. that are you know able to yeah. do this stuff. Yeah. But then what are we doing to make sure that that digital divide isn't, you know, well, it has exploded essentially. And so what are we going to do to kind of assist um, people with the most at stake? Yeah, I, I like that premise, and I think it's got a two edge. It's got two edges to it, hasn't it? And but I'm I'm like a very optimistic person by nature, and I sort of look at this and say, I'm actually I'm intrigued and encouraged by like what I see on uh, social media at the moment is people trying to have fun. People trying to have fun. You know, there's there's memes, there's people singing, there's you've got people switching on and off lights to you know acknowledge people living near them and filming it. You've got uh, people cooking a lot more and, and sharing their videos online. You've got people talking about subjects that perhaps they wouldn't get online and talk about. So I think that's a, a really wonderful thing for us to have happen. I know that that puts a lot more content out there, but I think that's really quite the way of the world moving forward is that you know we will pick and choose and look at this content and enjoy some moments that we see with, with someone else's life that's playing out on online and um, enjoy it and I- interact with it rather than being that separate piece that, you know, you put something online and it's more about what I just picked up the kids and brought them home and, you know, I want to celebrate that. I think things will start to be a lot more open and people's lives will start to be a lot more open and blended with their work life, which I think is a really good thing. Uh, one of the one of the things I think about smart communities is I've always been fascinated. Um, I've worked in some organisations where the organisation itself has said, I don't want people using the web while they're at work, which has really always sort of fascinated me because they expect you to be online, you know, when you're shopping at the supermarket and they'd like to call you and talk about something from a work point of view. They want you to be available, but they don't want you to be able to, you know, book a holiday or look at the, your bank account or pay a bill when you're at work. And I think that's going to rapidly change. As you say, there is really no difference between work and uh, family or life outside of work. When you get it blended into this scenario we're in now, it just becomes part of the new norm that sometimes I'll be working and right after this call, I might jump off and, uh, you know, not book a family holiday, obviously, but I might pay a bill. And that becomes just part of the new norm. And I'll take my next call on Zoom in another half an hour. And in that half an hour, I'll I'll do something that's um, about my personal life. So I'm actually encouraged by that. I think that's a really good change that we've been through that will help smart communities probably move forward more rapidly than what we uh, had six to eight weeks ago when, you know, there were still those who wanted to stop that type of interaction during working hours I think this is going to drive a new dynamic into the workforce where they expect that they are able to do things when they need to. Yeah, um, that flexibility, I guess. And I guess there's a culture thing that needs to, that they then will shift, um, but like the technology aspect of it as well, that, you know, having those systems and processes to be able to do that. And then I guess moving to a more outcomes-based work uh, where uh, you're working on things, it's not, okay, well, I, you know, put down eight hours of that, so that's my effort. The effort is actually the output. Um, you've got to be a little bit careful because I think if you're a contractor and you're not valuing your time and, you know, you might end up getting paid a couple of dollars an hour if you're only on output. So there's yes. a few things that need to be ironed out there and making sure that as an employer that we're sensible in that or I guess responsible in that aspect, but then also from the, well, a staff member, if it's employee, it's a contractor, whatever, those things are becoming quite fluid. 
Um, but then, yeah, the, the checks and balances and the safety nets and processes, I think they have been really exposed because of COVID as well. And, and I think there'll be lots of conversations and lots of changes around how we make sure that people, they are working on a contract basis, that they still are protected um, when something like this happens yes. um, or whatever. But I think blending work and home life is something that, I mean, for me, like I, my work is my passion, but then I also do stuff you know, outside of work as well. But for me, I have to chunk out my time because otherwise I'll just spend all day working. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so I think there's lots around that. And I think it doesn't just come naturally necessarily to everybody. So there is a really, like there's a kind of a learning curve to make sure that we are looking after ourselves at the same time as thriving in our work environments. It's really funny you say that. A, a good friend of mine was just sharing with me this week that she is now putting a scheduled time in to wash her hair because she's so busy on Zoom calls with work that I'm now having to sort of schedule in my priorities just for, you know, personal care. Uh, quite interesting, yeah. that change in dynamic that's only happened in a short period of time. And, bec- and I think you've touched on it because we've moved so rapidly to this way of, of living. Uh, I call it living because it's not just about work. I think we're all living this way now. That's just, that's a phenomenal change in such a short period of time. So there will be... I think that uh, you're highlighting something that is is really quite important is that there should be further dialogue on this and further conversation with community groups. I think that's where it should start with local Mm. groups, families, local groups, organisations and businesses about how um, is this going to change for us from now on? What's going to be the new norm? And some of those things that you hit upon, Zoe, will stay. They'll stay for good. Other things probably won't, and let's see where that takes us in terms of, you know, what that looks like for smart communities. But I, again, I feel very optimistic about the future. I think, I think this is going to be good in terms of resonating. Look, the death and the, everything that's happening is horrible and terrible. I think we have to look at how, you know, what learnings we take out of this because viruses appear to be part of that new norm as well. And I, I think we shouldn't be complacent in the way we move forward here. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, tell us about some of the projects and things that you're working on or have been working on previously. Um, and tell us a little bit about your business. Yeah, so Alchemy Solutions is an Australian owned and operated organization. We uh, specialize in helping organizations make shifts with technology. So, particularly um, emerging technology uh, is something we really do well. Uh, we come at it from a people centric perspective. So, we start with people first and then we work our way through the, you know, the journeys that customers or employees would go through. And then we talk to organizations about what they want to achieve out of putting in place technology. Then we help implement. We help implement, we help do the change management piece. We believe that change management and delivery is one and the same. We work across a range of industries. Aviation was a big industry for us. Health is, higher education, retail. We also work across finance and superannuation. And I think some of the projects we've been working on, you know, fascinating for me is I did a piece of work in Hong Kong probably a couple of years ago now. And what was interesting for me in that, in that community was that, you know, the piece of work I was doing was for the airline, but once the strategy was completed for them, I was ready to pack up and come home. And they said to me, no, no, you need to go share this with um, the central government. You need to go share this with the airport and you need to go share this with the trains, uh, people who run the train systems and also the local retailing community. And I was sort of like taken back, you know, why, why would you want me to do that? Well, because this is a connected space, Hong Kong's very closed in. We've got a lot of people living here. So we take it upon ourselves to share information with each other that's going to help understand how we make this a a really smart, tight community. And I took a lot of lessons out of that, Zoe, because I think that um, for me is a really great way of thinking about how we create smart communities here in Australia and um, the rest of the world. You know, There's already been people thinking about how we share and I think sharing is going to be a really important part moving forward from a technology point of view. So that was that was a project I thought I'd share with you. Mm, no, uh, sharing is so important and it sounds really like basic, but it's uh, unbelievable how much we don't share because particularly if it didn't go so well, right, um, yeah, we don't want to yeah. share our learnings, but we need to because 
like Hong Kong, like our communities, like, you know, we're in a global community now. Everything affects everyone else as we can see right at this moment, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, if we don't share those learnings, then we're, we're not going to be able to move forward. And, you know, making the same mistakes over and over again, it's just not useful for anyone's time, right? Yeah, and resources yeah. And, and oh, that's true. Lives, right? That's and true. So, no, thanks for sharing that. That's a great example. And I think that's something we can take away, particularly in Australia. I think we don't share enough, particularly like I think, not particularly, I, I guess uh, across all fields, like industry, government. I think academia is probably better at sharing. But, yeah, we do really need to share those lessons learned. But then, yeah, when it does go really well, Let's take that model and, you know, it obviously won't be exactly the same everywhere, but then we can uh, adapt and change as we need to. Yes. Yeah. That whole knowledge yeah. of power needs to be sort of let go in this new world, I think. Yeah. 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 yeah wasn't, there's a new term, like it not, it's not knowledge is power, it's um, connection is power or connect, oh, something. I can't remember what it is. I like that. We'll go with connection we'll is power. With, yeah. You heard it here first. Um, yeah. That's good. Yeah. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about emerging trends if you're in that space. So what do you think the emerging trends are that people aren't talking about enough? Yeah, look, I, I, do, I, do, I touched on it before and I think we need to really contemplate this. There's, a, there's always been this sort of fear of technology doing it to us, you know, the rise of AI, robots, you know, we're all going to get our jobs taken away and driverless cars and, you know, they'll run off the road, all that type of uh, discussion. But I do think we need to continue to drive a dialogue around the involvement of technology and how it will change based upon COVID-19. Like I think, you know, we talked a little bit about health and uh, wearables and monitoring, and we've seen some success with some countries taking those approaches. And I think that's going to be a really important conversation for us as communities to have moving forward because I, I personally think there's some benefit in some of those strategies, but we're all going to have to feel very comfortable with that because it's going to be a different sort of look. It's going to be a different feel for us as we start to think about someone tracking us. You know, we always sort of have tracking with our phones. People can, you know, you can see where you left your phone. If someone wants to really find you, they can find you via different applications and different things. But this is going to be a much more connected environment where we as people are connected into grids and conversations and health checks and, you know, to get into, to get into airports, they're talking about, you know, the fact that you'll have to go through, through some sort of scanner that will measure your temperature. And if you've got a temperature above a certain amount, you, you may not be able to fly with other passengers that are healthy. So that dialogue, I think, is and trend is going to be a really important one to discuss. Because I don't think that's going to be as easy as just saying, you know, let's just uh, roll out this technology because it's going to be better for us. I think we need to be really careful about accepting what that looks like moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and accepting the precedent as well, I think is important. I was talking to someone in the US and with, you know, privacy, the more, and when we have, say, a device like a um, smart speaker, so Google Home, Alexa, whatever, in our home, that we're accepting a certain level of surveillance, for example. Yes, yes. And then if something happens and then somebody records us and then they use that as evidence, if we have accepted a certain level of surveillance as a community or a society, then we may not then be able to say, no, we don't want that part to happen which I found really interesting. And obviously that story is not the exact yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. bit of full of holes, but along those lines, it's like, what things are we going to accept? And, you know, are we going to accept them for right now because there's, there's a health crisis and, but then what do we need to make sure that, okay, well that happened right now, but actually after this, then there'll be a different level and, and a different conversation. And we need to then think about the impacts and all those type of things as well. It won't, it can't, it cannot be just a, oh, yeah, we've rolled this out. Everyone must accept it. Yeah. So, I mean, so much agreement with that. I think we have to start and finish with people. And, you know, I listen to lots of technology briefs and lots of um, interviews online. And, you know, the technologists are really running wild at the moment with all their thoughts, which is great. I love listening to that. But I always want to understand what, what does this mean for people? And mm -hmm. I think, that dialogue needs to be yeah, happen first and last and we need to make this work for our communities and, yeah, make sure that change happens really well. Yeah, and I think if, if the focus is, and I was listening to a, a webinar this week sometime um, in the US, I think I mentioned it before, 
but you know, very much focused on, well, we get excited about technology, but actually there's some really fundamental things that we could do to stop the spread, well, which we're doing now, specifically related to COVID, obviously. And it was in the US, so it was like fund public health. And so I find, and obviously that's not exactly the same conversation that we're having here and it's not the one that we need to have, but along those same lines, we need to have some of those conversations, you know, okay, we are going to invest this amount of money in this technology because it is, and not that, you know, not to downplay technology and and its role because there's huge amounts, there's so many roles, but we really, and particularly in like, you know, new, um, obviously vaccines and and those type of things and, you know, all those um, health treatments what do we want to invest our time, money and effort in? And so I think those conversations will be really, really interesting and need to happen you know, immediately or yesterday. And I think they need to be with all levels of government, but then the experts and the community, the community and, and they'll be really robust conversations. And that engagement, oh, it's going to be so interesting to not just watch, be part of and really shape what we wanted the outcomes to be as well. I agree with you, Zoe. I think that's um, I think that's really crucial. Uh, you know, the the point of mental health we haven't discussed either. But I think yes. that's you know when I say health, I just you know I, I I forget to say mental health. And you know, it's such a challenging time for everyone. And you know, when I say fathom, it's hard to fathom that all this is going on in 2020. You know, like if we were writing sort of a movie script, we'd have a perfect scenario here. You know. Eight weeks ago, we were living a normal life. Then someone supposedly ate a bat, and uh, we are now living in an era of a global pandemic, where there's two million people infected, and um, and you know we're talking here about the new normal of our lives. So it's quite a um, a large scale change that we're all going through, and that needs some time. That needs some time and some dialogue to discuss and empathise and. You know, I think human connection, you know, we talked about it before. We talked about people being the centre of this, but human connection and just lives are, are, is the new sort of conversation point because this is what it really touches on. It's not mm-hmm. it's not a periphery thing. You, we've talked about it a few times in this conversation, but it's, it's actually at the centre of what we're really talking about. And so this needs some careful consideration for what happens next. Thanks so much for coming on to the podcast. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I am going to have to wrap up, unfortunately, because I have another. Yeah, I'm call. disappointed as well. We, yeah, we, another time, I'm sure we'll, we'll get to yeah. talk. No, let's yeah. do it. And I want to say thanks to Sally Illingworth for introducing us. That's great. Oh, that's um, right. Yeah. Yeah. And she's been one of the ones that's been having lots of fun on LinkedIn. Uh, and I'll be having a chat with her next week, actually, and hopefully doing a LinkedIn Live with her as well. And oh, great. Probably- yeah, which will be really fun. I look fun. forward to watching that. Yeah, yeah. I, I enjoy uh, watching Sally's interviews. She's very talented, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I just love her perspective on things. And she's been on the podcast. And I was asking one of my social media person that, you know, does my social media for me. And um, she and I said, oh, did you like the interview with Sally? And she's like, oh, yeah, no, it was actually one of your best ones because it, it was real. It was – and she was like, it's not like your other ones weren't real, but it was just authentic and you, it was like you were talking to a friend and you were just sharing stories, information. And I think that's so true, particularly in this time, that we need to, I guess, need to be authentic is you know, a bit of a buzzword or whatever, but just be ourselves. And the reason I'm doing a lot of these you know, sharing stories of what's happening during this time is I wasn't going to, but then I realized actually it's not about information and telling people what to do and what to expect and what to feel and whatever. It's actually just about sharing our stories um, because that can be quite, it builds connection and it builds hope that, you know, there are people in the world that are you know, thinking about what's going to happen next, but then they're also real people as well. Like yeah. you said, I think like the real yeah. I think yeah. I think I think that's right. I, I really love that. I think that that's exactly right. And it's, um, you know, Sully's really good at that. I think at be it authentic. I think you two, uh, Zoe, and, and maybe one thing we should do is have you and I and um, Sally all on a call at some stage because yes. I don't always agree with Sally. That's one thing I want to say to you. So that would make some entertaining conversation between the three of us. You might have to mediate, yeah. virtually get between us and make sure there's no... She can be quite, you know, Argy, so just make sure you keep an eye on her when we have that conversation. Yep. And that's the thing. We don't have to agree with each other all the time. And that's no. like, and, and I think we need to be able to have this conversation. Now you've got me on a rant, um, which is, you know, diversifying 
the tribe that we hang out with because we don't want to agree with each other all the time, right? No, it, do, it doesn't add anything to the narrative if we, if we all agree. Uh, respectfully, of course, you, you know, I think there's got to be some boundary to that as people. But yeah, look, I, I love that authentic debate. I think that's a very engaging format for people to get some further perspective on something, uh, on a topic that they'd like to understand a little bit more and add themselves. I think that's one of the beautiful things that we can get to happen here is that, you know, your podcast will go on, people will make comments. Some of those will be interesting and engaging. Some of those will just be wanting to say something about, you know, my glasses. But nonetheless, people are engaging, which is great. Yeah. yeah. And we do have to wrap up. But okay, there's a quote by, um, what's his name, Mark Randall from... Netflix, the co-founder yes, of the net yes. founder of Netflix. Anyway, he says nobody knows anything. And at first I was like, yeah, that's true, whatever else. But actually I've, I've taken the liberty to change that to nobody knows everything. I like it. Which means that when we have these conversations, you know, there are going to be differences of opinion, different expertise. And if we don't start engaging with other people and joining the conversation, then, you know, we will only stay at the same status quo, which is, you know, not what Smart Communities is all about. Yeah. Thank okay. you so much for having me, Zoe. No, thank you for coming on. Now, um, one last question. How can people connect with you? Uh, look, uh, people can connect with me. I'm on LinkedIn. It's Luke Stowe, S-T-O-W, or you can email me at Luke.Stowe, S-T-O-W, at alchemysolutions.com.au. Great. We'll put the links in the show notes so people can click away and find you. And we will hang out digitally soon, maybe uh, with Sally as well. And that will be super fun. Yeah, let's do that. That'd be super fun. Yeah. See you, Zoe. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. The Smart Community Podcast is brought to you by My Smart Community. If you're trying to deal with disruption, not sure what technologies to buy, need to facilitate genuine collaboration, then we can help. Email hello at mysmart.community or head to www.mysmart.community forward slash consulting. Thanks so much for listening to the Smart Community Podcast. Show notes for this episode and all other episodes are available on our website, mysmart.com community slash podcast if you have any questions for us or any of our guests you can email hello at mysmart.community you can also find us on the socials we are on linkedin and twitter at smartcomhq that's com with two m's if you are enjoying the podcast please hit subscribe so you never miss an episode and we would love for you to leave us a rating and review at wherever you listen. This really helps us reach more ears and eyes, so thank you for your support. As always, we hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. The Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for. 